In the last video we saw the bishop h6 trick happening on the Petrov defense. However, it can also be applied in almost any other opening as well. d4, a knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3. Most likely Lalic didn't like to have the Nimzu Indian on the board, which would happen after knight c3, bishop b4. In my opinion, the Nimzu Indian is black's best opening after first d4. Actually, it is the only opening where the engine states equality after only three moves. And this also includes openings after first e4. So, coming back to the move knight f3, what can black do? Black could give a check on b4. This would be the Bogo Indian defense, hoping for knight c3 transposing to the Nimzu Indian. But white can achieve a slight advantage both after bishop d2 and knight bd2 here. Better than bishop b4 check is the move d5, which leads to a version of the queen's gambit declined, which is quite nice for black, as white already has committed his knight to f3. Then we have also c5, which can lead to the modern Benoni after d5. I guess this is just slightly better for white. I consider the Benoni as a flawed opening. In the game we saw the move b6. This is the queen's Indian defense. I played myself. It is very much in line with the spirit of the Nimsu Indian. It's a modern approach um, or, or let's say it's a, a hybrid between modern and classical chess. Black wants to find Keto the bishop to b7, but sometimes the bishop goes to a6. Now white's main move is g3, but in the game we see white playing a3. a3 is uh, the, the move number two here by frequency. It is one third as often played um, as move g3. a3 is called the Petrosian variation named after the ninth world champion Tigran Petrosian from Armenia. The idea is to follow up with knight c3 without being molested by bishop b4 in Nimzu Indian style. Now black has two options, bishop b7 or bishop a6. In the game we see black playing bishop b7, the normal looking move, but bishop a6 is a good alternative leading to a more complex fight. Bishop b7 is a more classical, more solid approach. It uh, equalizes without any bigger problems. Knight c3, d5. And now there are three main moves. In the game we see white playing queen c2. The idea is to capture on d5 and after knight takes d5, to follow up with e2, e4. So the queen is then protecting on the pawn. The move c takes d5 is um, the most popular move with more than 11,000 games. On second place, we see bishop g5. And this move here, queen c2, was played more than 800 times already. Now black took the pawn on c4. Another good option is bishop e7. It's played maybe double as often as um, d takes c4. Both moves are equally strong, however. So after bishop e7, I should just show you quickly how the game might unfold. c takes d5. Now black has two options. The inferior one is to recapture the pawn. At first glance, that looks very solid because you have like a pawn in the center. You have a lot of grip in the center here with black. But the, the pawn structure is a bit problematic after bishop f4. This c c7 pawn uh, is a bit fragile in the c file. It is true that it can be pushed to c5. Then it is not weak anymore. 
but after c5 um, we mostly have two different pawn structures arising if there will be a, a change or exchange between the d pawn and the c pawn uh, we will uh, see an isolated pawn position so black will end up with an isolated queen's pawn on d5 which of course is a weakness uh, the other potential pawn structure of the c5 is when white captures and black recaptures with the b pawn then we have pawns on d5 and c5 called the hanging pawns the name already implies that the hanging pawns tend to be um, rather weak than strong so both structures are normally slightly better for white that's why black should consider to take with a knight instead on d5 here the pawn structure is without any floor white would uh, continue with e4 and after knight c3 bc3 castles bishop d3 c5 we see a pawn structure um, which is known from the Grünfeld Indian defense there the bishop stands on g7 as it is firemketed but the central structure is the same after castles queen c7 threatening to capture on d4 and to trade queen so white has to remove the queen and now knight d7 we this position here is roughly equal white has some space advantage in the center that is true uh, but black already managed to exchange one pair of minor pieces so the space advantage white has is not that impactful anymore uh, apart from that um, black has um, some chances against the weak pawn a3 in the end game and of course black also has a minority on the queen side so there's a potential of creating an outside passed pawn the position is roughly equal in the game however we saw um, the move d takes c4 instead of bishop e7 this is also a good move for black white plays e4 building up a strong pawn center and black directly attacks white's center normally you should not tolerate um, such a strong pawn center and you should try to disrupt it as early as possible now white has two options he can play d5 as in the game or he can take on c5 let's have a look at the alternative move d takes c5 this is a rather feeble move because it doesn't pose any problems to black bishop c5 bishop c4 i now just give one straight line we don't make it too complicated here we don't make we don't want to make the video uh, too long so let's get into it castles castles knight bd7 bishop d4 knight h5 attacking the bishop the bishop is attacking the queen the queen can now go both to c7 or b8 let's consider just this line here queen b8 rook a d1 attacking the knight and now the knight has a good square in the middle of the board so it has to be exchanged the bishop g5 is under attack so now it's defended by the queen of course the queen on e5 uh, stands there quite proudly it cannot be expelled by f4 as the f pawn is pinned h6 attacking the bishop bishop e3 takes takes rook fd8 and this position here is equal um, actually I would prefer the black side of it because white has potentially problems with the bishop c4 which is neutralized by these pawns here on f7 and e6 and also um, is a bit impeded by its fellow pawn on e4 so um, white has to be careful not to end up in a position in an end game with a bad bishop here but the position is equal nevertheless now after c5 our game move is d5 it's not leading to advantage but it gives black some 
more problems than the move d takes c5, as we could see in the present game. Takes, takes. Now the right mood would have been bishop d6, just developing, blocking the d5 pawn. And after bishop takes c4, castles, castles, h6, preparing bishop g5, uh, preventing bishop g5, sorry, rook e1, a6, intending b5, a4, preventing b5, knight b7, b3, the bishop might be played to b2 later, queen c7, connecting the rooks, uh, also potentially attacking the h2 pawn, h3, so the pawn is now saved prophylactically, and now knight e5, here we can stop, this position is equal, we see white having a pass pawn on d5, but this pawn is blocked, it is no danger here, it doesn't pose an imminent danger for black, and it can also turn out to be weak actually, so it's a double-edged thing to have such a pass pawn. Chances are even here. Now, um, in our game, black committed a severe mistake. He took the pawn. He took the bait. That was a bit greedy. White captured on c4. Now I want to give you a moment. Think about this position. How would you, by gut feeling of course, how would you estimate this position? I will say the solution in, in, in a couple of seconds so we can press on stop now. Okay, so actually, believe it or not, this position is already won for white. Because black is behind in development and his king is stuck in the center. And this is something he cannot overcome. Of course, it needs concrete lines to exploit this, but we will now see how white managed to grab the full point. What can black do here? In the game we saw the normal looking move bishop e7. Uh, this didn't turn out to be very well for black, so let's also consider some alternatives. Of course, black can take the knight. Then we recapture with the queen. Now the problem is that the queen is setting its sight on the g-pawn, so the bishop f8 is nailed to its place. What can black do? One line is knight c6, we play bishop g5, attacking the queen um, with gain of tempo, f6, in order to also gain time here. But white can simply let the bishop hang on g5, castles f takes g5, rook f, e1, and um, white is already winning because if the black king walks to d7, there's rook a, d1 check following, uh, winning some material on the d file. If bishop e7 happens and queen takes g7 is winning. After queen takes c3, black can also try to swap queens in order to release the pressure a bit. A bit. Uh, but now white simply answers with knight g5, attacking the f7 pawn. Takes, takes, and now this attack on the pawn is simply too strong. Um, black's best move here is bishop e7, but after bishop takes f7 check, king f8, threatening bishop g5, followed by King takes f7, so the bishop um, moves away. In this position, there are no queens anymore on the board, but still white has a dangerous and actually lethal initiative. White will castle, uh, develop uh, with bishop f4, rook e1, rook a1, and simply penetrate black's position um, through the center. Black's problem, as you can see here, um, indicated in yellow, is the rook h8, which is out of play, and the king f8, which is uh, still in the danger zone. This is a problem of black's position, and it cannot be overcome.
After bishop c4, there's also another move. Queen e7 check. Actually, this happened in a game. Petron against Lengiel, Hungary 1995. So black wants maybe to castle queenside and develops, uh, quote-unquote, the queen um, with check. The king moves to the side. Now the knight d5 is hanging, so the knight takes. And now the game, there happened queen takes c3, after which white was uh, still winning, but much better is b takes c3. The engine mm, considers this position as plus four for white, so white is, despite being uh, in uh, numeral terms, a pawn down, the engine gives white four pawn units plus because of his superior position. So after b takes c3, it's game over. Let's say knight c6, bishop g5, attacking with gain of tempo, f6, and now queen e1 is, uh, rook e1 is netting the queen. Now let's come back to our game. After bishop takes e4, black played the normal looking move, bishop e7, intending to castle away into safety. And now I give you another moment to think about white's next move. You can press on stop now. Otherwise, now the solution. It's our trick move, bishop h6. Like in the last game, and I'm referring to the, to the game Brown against uh, Biskir, white uh, develops in a very powerful manner by double attacking black. So the first threat is obviously bishop takes g7. The second one would be rook d1 or maybe even castle and queenside uh, when the knight d5 would be pinned in the d-file. As it happened in the game of Walter Brown, um, the rook a1 is brought into play with gain of tempo. In the brown game, the rook was destined for e1. Here it is d1. Now let me just give you some ideas of, of how people can think about chess. There are at least four different levels. Level one is the level of concrete moves. So if you learn opening theory, you learn a sequence of concrete moves. Uh, this is, of course, important uh, as far as it, uh, it considers the main lines. You, you have to know a minimum of opening theory, but you cannot exaggerate here because no human being has the capacity of a computer. And that's why um, players normally tend to rather like to think in terms of pawn structures, pawn structures rather than concrete lines, because this is much easier to put to memory. You have certain pawn structures and then you learn the plans, uh, the adequate plans. You, you, you learn where the pieces belong, where to put the king, which pieces to exchange, uh, how to move your pawns and so on. So this is a, a widespread approach on structural thinking. Then there's the third level and the, those are micro patterns or micro structures. And this is what I, my videos um, are about. The videos I'm just presenting you now, starting with the video um, Brown versus Bisker, Chicago 1974, the last video. It is this microstructure. I will just make it green here. So we have these three pawns and we have that bishop here. This is the same structure as we have seen it in the Brown game. These microstructures are a mixture of um, positional and um, tactical, or the, let's say the fabric of the structure is both tactical and positional. Here it is a bit more, more tactical because we see there is a direct threat to the g-pawn. 
The fourth level of thinking is uh, the conceptual level. Um, as we will go along with looking at this microstructure here, also in the coming videos, we will see different motivations, different underlying motivations. Here the concept is quite clear. It is about speed, it's about um, double attacking, it's about activating the queen's rook. So that is actually the common denominator here of the two games, Lalic Tezic and Brown versus Bisker. We have the same microstructure and we have the same underlying concept, uh, clearance of the first rank and um, speedy activity putting the opponent under imminent pressure. Um, so now let's see what black can do in this position. In the game black actually defended the pawn g7. Let's see what are the alternatives. Of course we have to start with g takes h6 or with the critical move. Now uh, there's a game actually, Jiggle against Crawford, uh, email 1995, where rook d1 happened. But the best move, according to the engine, is might takes d5. Bishop takes d5, and now castling queenside. Now, normally white's next move would be bishop takes d5, which was, would both th threatening Bishop takes f7 check with attack against the queen, but of course also the rook a8 would be under attack. And this is quite devastating already for black. You see black's problem on the light squares here. What else can black do after bishop h6? Black can also take on c3. Now we take on g7 attacking the rook and after rook g8 we can win both by bishop takes c3 or by queen takes h7. Both is easily winning. The third move after bishop h6 is castling short. Now the best move by, given by the engine is knight takes d5. G takes h6, queen f5, and there is, amongst others, the idea to play bishop d3 with an attack. Sorry, that was a bit dirty, dirtily drawn, with the idea to give checkmate on h7. That is the best, but it is followed very closely by rook d1. Rook d1 might be a bit more um, easy to understand, so I give this line now. What can um, black do? Yeah, black can, for instance, take the bishop and now we castle, followed by um, knight d5 or even rook takes d5. So <clears throat> if we would were to move again here as white, we could also take with a rook because after bishop takes d5, bishop d5, the rook a8 would be under attack. This is also clearly one, like plus four pawns. Now let's have a look at the game. After bishop h6, um, Lalic opponent played bishop f6 defending the pawn. But actually this is not really a tough response um, because white can now win quite easily. White took on d5, bishop d5, castling of course now we see bishop takes d5 as a threat so uh, Tezik tried to seal the d-file by putting the bishop to d4 but this is not really helping him a lot bishop takes d5 queen d5 Bishop uh, g7. It's not the only move. Also, rook takes d4, c takes d4, queen c8 check is winning. But bishop g7 is a very simple uh, and efficient move as well. Rook g8 check. 
the king has to go to the d file and now as you can see the d file is opened when the <clears throat> there is a skewer in place the rook d1 is having the queen and the king on its skewer i hope you like this little miniature it was a quite strong demonstration of the the powerful bishop h6 trick see you in the next bishop h6 video then bye bye